Hey, Ryan, how's it going? Hey, excited to be on the show today. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you taking the time to jump on. You're a busy guy. Sprig's a busy place. And uh, you were nice enough to take time out of your day and kind of come on and chat with me on our podcast. So I appreciate that. Yeah, excited to be here and talk research. Nice. Well, we are going to do that. And, uh, you know, as we typically do, though, in the show, before we jump into any you know meaty topics, I like to have people introduce themselves, maybe talk a little bit about your background and kind of like your perspective in case folks haven't heard of you or, or followed any of your work up to this point. Yeah, happy to. My background's always been in product management and joined, you know, for four different companies, pre-product market fit, help them find product market fit and go on to be successfully acquired. And then I joined Weebly uh, post-product market fit and really helped them scale to run 400 people to the acquisition of Square. And I found a common theme around these product teams, you know, researchers, product managers, designers, all having all these questions for their customers those why questions that all emerge from looking at our analytics data or revenue data and seeing drop-offs and trends and, you know, patterns and behaviors that we just really want to dig in and ask why and saw that it was just incredibly broken using these long-winded email surveys that were so disconnected Mm -hmm. and detached from the product experience. Mm -hmm. And so how helpful is it to send out a 50 question email survey months after using a product or trying a new feature And so, you know, really saw the power of in-product surveys when I was at Weebly. We built some homegrown versions internally, and it was just a huge impact on the direction, our decision-making, our understanding of the customer. And when I left Weebly, um, took some time off and wanted to really solve that problem for all the other high growth and at scale tech companies out there. And so was very intentional about working with companies that were Post product market fit, really on mm. their way to um, to doing great things in the world. And some of those early companies include Coinbase and Square and Robinhood and Dropbox, and uh, who all worked with us, you know, before we publicly announced. Um, and you know, since then we've been off to the races, bringing on just so many of the best in class uh, research teams from companies like Notion, you know, Cash App, um, Figma. PayPal, just to name a few, mm-hmm. and really helping them scale their understanding of their user experience through in-product surveys. And earlier this year, we just launched session replay as well. And so two different ways to collect data at scale. We have AI that then analyzes all the data and helps these teams make sense of what's really happening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. Uh, there's a couple of things that you mentioned in there that really kind of strike me. I appreciate like your and Sprig's sort of intense focus. You know, you could just say we're we're a a customer research tool and we're doing all these things to help you capture feedback or uh, in product analytics and surveys and all that stuff. But you're super, super specific in the focus of like, we want to do this for these people really well. And um, the other thing that really struck me with that is, you know, part of your introduction was, you know, my background is, in UX research, product strategy stuff. Uh, and becoming a founder was different. And you start learning a lot about that. And you realize some of the most successful founders are the ones who did what you just described, which is to say, this is something I have a problem with. <laughs> and so I want to chase that down and fix that. Uh, and that's exactly what it sounds like happened with the inception of Sprig. Yes, you're absolutely right. Just hyper-focused on working with these companies that are quickly growing and specifically around giving them that contextual feedback about their very specific parts of their product experience. You know, it's not MPS that we're, we offer MPS, but it's not really what people use us for. (laughs) They like to to really get in there and ask, you know, after a trade or a deposit or an Mm. onboarding experience and really get in the moment to deeply understand what's working and not working about those specific flows in the user journey. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, the the whole mention of NPS is like, uh, especially, you know, most of the people listening to this are UX researchers. There's very strong opinions. on. Some people are like, (laughs) Oh yeah, we do NPS. Some people are like, you know, like uh, garlic to a vampire, (laughs) but I'm not here to open that debate necessarily. Um, But it is interesting to hear you say that. Cause I mean, yeah, I mean, even there it's like, look, we offer it. It is a tool. You can use it if you choose Mm -hmm. to or not. But I actually, I really appreciate the laser focus that you have on this. To me, those are characteristics. Those are two characteristics of 
successful products and successful companies. So that's really kind of cool to hear. Um, I guess, you know, one of the things that I'm curious about as you were talking through that, if you could share more detail about sort of the old way, right? There were just like surveys getting sent out as opposed to, as you know, you were describing it in product contextual surveys. I mean, for, for folks that are UX researchers, they might understand that, but we have lots of people who listen to this, product managers, designers. What's the difference between those two and maybe why one or the other? Yeah. If you think about even going back to, you know, how surveys were always collected and conducted with, you know, people, whether it's consumer, whether it's businesses, it was typically a list of questions, you know, 10 to 20 questions. And that's really where companies like Qualtrics and SurveyMonkey and Typeform and Medallia got started were these longer, long form surveys that were sent to us, maybe in the mail, you know, mm. maybe they were <laughs> oh, geez, uh, yeah. a, a email survey, a link to click and take 10 minutes of your day to fill out. And when I was at Weebly, we hired this phenomenal research team and they brought in Qualtrics, mm -hmm. which is you know the best in class, a uh, long form survey tool out there. And the product team, we were looking to deeply understand about some of the new features that we had launched in the past quarter. And we started to kind of add, go around and add all of our questions and about my features and other designers were, or product managers were asking about their features and other product managers were adding questions about their features and it got to be, a hundred questions in this survey. And we ended up having to offer a $150 gift card for people yeah. to get through this really long survey to ask about all the different moments that people had had in the past one to five months with our product. Yeah, And I just saw how disconnected it was where you really want to ask the feedback. It's almost like when you're watching someone live and you want to tap them on the shoulder and be like, Hey, it looks like you got stuck there. Help me kind of yeah. understand what happened. And so thought about first principles and what we can do to rethink how survey data is collected in a very contextual targeted way. Mm -hmm. And really the first year, year and a half of the company was building an event-based architecture that really served as the underlying architecture for the end product survey platform. And right. that had never been done before to be able to take all the same techniques of analytics uh, and say, let's go specifically to this group of people who had just used this product or used this product five times and really ask them in that moment, what's working or not working about that feature, that flow, mm -hmm. that journey as they're going through it. And so you can think about as you're going through a product, you're booking something, you're completing a journey or you're adding a product to your store that's really when you have the emotion. Mm -hmm. That's when you have the question, the concern, the feeling. And we want to really meet the user where they're at as those that sentiment is really occurring. Yeah. And so Spriga is just really about being hyper-targeted and, and really digging into understanding what users think in that moment with these in-product surveys that are all based on users' actions or inactions. Yeah, that's really interesting to me because what it makes me think about from a pure UX researcher standpoint is like, if you're going to do interviews or, uh, you know, just any kind of feedback testing, usability testing, you're going to have to like screen and recruit people. If you're doing a good survey, even if it's a long form survey, typically you would have to do that. But it sounds like in this case, it actually removes a lot of the need for that because, well, this is actual behavior. You're able to say this happened. So let's trigger this question or set of questions to really learn about that more specifically too, sort of right at the point in time it's happening. Exactly. So we know hundred percent confidence. The person just went through that flow. Mm -hmm. And to your point, we can ask about specifically what they just did in the product and get that feedback in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, I can see the benefit of that for sure. Uh, this is a totally left field question, but I get it asked it a lot uh, as a founder. So I just kind of want to ask you, I mean, why the name Sprig? Where did that come from? Great question. We started out at userleap.com. So okay. some folks might know us as Userleap. And you know, we're about two years in. We had raised around 60 million at the time. And you know, I thought our $12 domain was a great start, but <laughs> it, it's there's other companies that start with user out there. And yeah. we really wanted to build a 
iconic brand that we could really own a word that when people heard that word, they thought of us. And I was so inspired by companies like Apple and Slack and Figma and Plaid. And even I think Aurelius is a great example. When people think of, you know, Aurelius, they think of uh, your company. Mm-hmm. And that's really what I wanted with Sprig. And with User Leap, there were, you know, there's some other companies that also had user in the name and they didn't always think of that brand that we we're really looking to build and invest in. And so we hired a naming agency, Lexicon. You know, they had come up with names like Febreze and Sonos and PowerBook. And, you know, they worked with them on a list of names. We wanted the .com as well. Had to be able to trademark this in the US, Europe, Asia. Right. So it was definitely a whole ordeal to go through that and, and to get the, the domain and make sure we can get something that we can trademark. And Sprig was the one that really checked all those boxes for us. And so we're really excited about that name that we can now really invest in and something that we can really build a brand around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting progression of a company too, to say, this is kind of where we started and that was fine. And we want to be more intentional about that. Uh, I, that's why I ask is because those are always sort of interesting journeys as to how that happened. Um, yes. And we absolutely have had the same thing where when we first started, people were like Aurelius, that might be kind of hard to spell. I don't know if that's a good idea. And I've, I always felt strongly oppositely. And I was like, no, because, uh, you know, obviously after the, uh, the Stoic philosopher, Marcus Aurelius, but completely different. So once people to you, you know, to your point, get that brand, it's like, they're actually going to, Aurelius is never going to get out of their head because it's not user something. It's not research <laughs> this. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And, and, you know, our story on how that happened was actually a little bit more uh, accidental, but a story for another time. Uh, anybody who wants to hear about it is welcome to reach out. Uh, and, and I'm happy to kind of share that, but, um, getting back to some things that you were talking about with this, like contextual in product feedback and these surveys and stuff, you know, you, you gather all of that. You've got to figure out what you learned. I mean, cause it's one thing to be able to ask this point in time. It's one thing to be very targeted, but ideally you're getting responses from, you know, several numbers of people in order to then bring it all back together and say, this is what we learned, right? You mentioned that you have AI and Sprig to do that. And this is a topic that's really top of mind for a lot of people for a lot of reasons, right? So AI and UX research is trickling down everywhere. Aurelius has it, Sprig has it, tons of other companies have it. Tell me a little bit about how Sprig decided to apply AI to help you make sense of this stuff. And, you know, when I was at Weebly, we were collecting all this really great data, you know, with our in-product survey and homegrown solution that was hacked together. We also had some really great survey data from, you know, our email surveys as well. And I saw our research team spending sometimes up to a week Mm -hmm. sifting through all the open text data, all the survey data, and many of them, they're PhD level researchers, really, really great at what they do but they always told me they wanted to focus on the more strategic projects for the company, understanding new markets and company directions and help inform the leadership team on customer challenges and really bigger topics that they feel like they could have more of an impact around. Mm -hmm. And they often say like, Hey, this is so critical though, for us to look through all these open-ended responses, the thousands that we have in a spreadsheet to really understand, and that's really where the magic happens with research, these open-ended yeah. questions. And so it was high, is extremely critical to analyze this data, but I often heard from them that it's something that they wish they could have offloaded to someone else. And <laughs> so, true. you know, when starting Sprig, I, the first person to join me at the company is our head of AI. And okay. we actually started building out the text analysis at the same time as building, writing the first line of code to okay. build the product. So we've been in the field of AI for you know 2019, the year the company was founded. And I remember at the time, the other players in the space, they were doing word clouds for their text analysis. Sure. I say price, you say price, you know, shows up as price in a single yep. word. You say cost, I say price, separate, right? Yep. It's not able to piece those two together. But I saw just how critical it was to be able to look at these responses 
even if users don't have any overlapping words or phrases, can we group those into the same theme? Mm -hmm. And so we had built all of our own tooling. We had human loop process of researchers training our models again, back to 2019 you know, using Google's open source models at the time. It wasn't called AI, it was called machine learning at the yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. Which technically it still is, right? But it technically still is. Yeah, this is, that's a whole separate topic. Sorry, I didn't yeah. mean that. And then earlier this year, we just uh, switched to the GPT-4 models for a text analysis. And with the new advancements in AI, we're now, we've significantly accelerated our AI roadmap. And so, you know, we started the text analysis in 2019 We've significantly up-leveled the accuracy, the speed, the sophistication mm -hmm. of the open text analysis. And we're now considered the leader you know, in the broader research category around open text analysis. And then earlier this year, we launched the, in really ingesting the entire survey into AI mm -hmm. and to be able to get a summary of the data, to ask questions about the data, correlation, strengths, opportunities, is all being surfaced in real time as the data is being collected. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of us thinking about going back to the work that the researchers say, hey, this is really critical, but I'd rather focus on something else and seeing if we could really use AI to help better empower those researchers to have that impact. And researchers, you know, often they tell us they measure their work by the impact they can have on the org. Mm -hmm. And so our goal is how can we drive more impact with the work that they're doing by better supporting them with AI. Yeah, interesting. Uh, that was actually something I was going to ask you about because, again, you say AI and UX research. There's strong opinions on both sides of that. I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, very well founded, healthy skepticism about the application of AI in UX research <clears throat> in a couple areas, right? accuracy, um, gaps, compliance, privacy, concern. I think all those things are like super relevant and healthy skepticism to have. And then on the other end of it, I think there's a lot of reception to that. That's what I was curious to ask you is that as you rolled this stuff out, you're serving, you know, a broad range of folks with a tool like Sprig, but especially UX researchers is like, what's been the reception to that? Because I think like I said, it can kind of be hit or miss depending on who it is and, and where they're coming from. It really is. You know, I think going back to the fundamentals of research, it's about having empathy for the people using our products. And I think where AI could take a wrong direction is not really focusing our research on the people using our products. You know, there's some companies in the space right now around synthetic users that don't actually exist. And asking models, asking other models questions about a product or a screen or a workflow. But research is digging into the people. It's not about understanding a model mm -hmm. that's been trained on the internet. It's about understanding mm -hmm. a person and their emotions and feelings and thoughts in the moment of them using a particular product or flow. Mm -hmm. And so where we're really focused on applying AI is really helping these researchers have more impact but sticking to the fundamentals of research of that empathy for the people using our products. And ultimately, you know, our goal is helping companies better understand how users, you know, um, better understand what they think of their products. Mm -hmm. And so that's really our singular focus. And we see AI really helping these researchers get there so much faster, mm -hmm. but also have such a greater impact by taking on some of the lower level work, like the text analysis, where it might get them 95% of the way there, they can then take it to that last mile, that 100%, really make sure it's perfect, yeah. but get that whole week back and think yeah. about those other higher level strategic projects. Yes, yes. So I think that this is really key. I'm glad I asked you that question. And um, I almost feel like I was leading you, but I, you know, I didn't. You ended up in the place that I was hoping you would. And that's very much our philosophy at Aurelius on AI for UX research. You know, so something that we launched called AI Assist helps you do just that. Now, obviously in Aurelius, it's a lot more about longer form qualitative stuff like interviews and usability tests or whatever, but that is exactly our intention with that. I think people out there who have this apprehension, again, justifiably so, 
that AI is going to take my job or um, it's going to, people are going to try to use it to replace UX research. I have strongly argued that that's not the case because the value of researchers is so far beyond those things that I share the philosophy and sentiment that AI can help us get from point A to point B faster, right? Where you finish that last 5% as, as you would say it, um, because that's where the most value of your work is applied for the reasons of impact, like you even mentioned earlier. Absolutely. And I think the where you know we see AI broadly going is that as you know humans, we move to more of an editor role mm. instead of a role of creating or you know doing the core work. We're really pulling together the final pieces. We're curating the suggestions from AI. We're doing a final pass for the work that the AI has done for us. Yeah. And that's where it enables us to have that impact and really increase our impact. And so many research teams we work with, they say, I'm only able to deliver on 20% of the team's questions or 50% of the team's questions or 10% of the team's questions. But with AI, we can maybe get a little bit further. Can we get to 70% or 80% or 100% by really just being able to cover so much more ground you know, with less time, with less resources okay. and have that impact across the organization. And so until we're at that hundred percent coverage and every question and every product is perfectly researched, which I think is a very aspirational right. goal, right. we just have so much, such a big gap to close and AI can really help us get there with the impact of research across these companies. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really funny because that was literally the next question I was going to ask you. You kind of, you kind of already started on it, which was, you know, broadly speaking, where does this go? But I, I, I will ask it pointedly if just, you know, how, how is AI going to continue to impact the work we do as UX researchers and people trying to understand customer needs? Yeah. I think it just goes back to that leverage. You know, every researcher can, really provide that much more coverage, that much more impact, answer that many more questions, validate or invalidate all the ideas, mm -hmm. uh, test new designs at 100% of those that are moved before they move on to engineering. Every new release, can we deeply understand how that change is impacting user experience, measure the incremental impact on mm -hmm. that user experience? And that's something that we're, you know, maybe less in the field of AI, but we're seeing a really interesting emerging use case of Sprig of integrating Sprig session replay and, and product surveys into feature flagging and A-B testing. And a lot oh, of the companies are saying, hey, I, step one, want to understand what users think about my product. And I'll ask very targeted surveys that are getting a 30% response rate compared to an email survey that's getting a, maybe a 2% response rate. But I want to take it a step further. And every time the, the team is rolling out an A-B test, a feature flag, a new change, the, you know, a, new, a new code change is deployed mm -hmm. to our customers, let's measure not only the business impact with the analytics, but also the user impact with session replay and end product surveys. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we're seeing a lot of companies think about how user research can not only think about these bigger strategic questions, but also measure the impact of the users in a more uh, high fidelity, um, you know, interaction type. And so you roll out a new redesign for a screen and a product. Can you actually measure a usability score between mm -hmm. the old and the new version and quantify the usability with users as they're actually using that new redesign against users who are still using that old redesign. So less in the field of AI, but I think we're just seeing the field of particularly quantitative research sure. be so much more embedded, contextual. I think that's where bringing it back to AI, it could be really powerful to have AI help understand where to look around all the changes that are happening mm -hmm. and measuring with you know quantitative research, how can we really understand and surface what changes we should be looking into and really spend our time there as research teams on the hotspots 
that are most relevant to our work and let us really focus on those. Yeah. You know, this, this ability to centralize focus, I think is really, really useful to talk about because I get asked this a lot as well. And one of the things that I've been talking to, you know, our customers, just other UX researchers about is to say, AI is not going to help anybody ask the right questions. AI is not going to know, at least all of this is certainly not true yet. I'll caveat with that. You know, somebody listened to this five years in the future. I have no idea where things are going to go, but you know, as it stands now, they're not going to have, AI is not going to have context of your organization to know what questions to ask. And, you know, the reason why you're asking that it's not necessarily going to know how to get you that last 5% as you referred to, to say, okay, we, we got from point A to point B faster, but what do we do about that? Uh, you know, and I think the best researchers, the most valuable people doing this work are the ones who really understand that. And I would almost encourage folks to think about it as a, the ability to have powers of scale for like human manpower, but but not really, right? So like all the things that you just described to me sounded like awesome. You know, if you're a big organization with a ton of money and you could hire all these people to be looking at that stuff, that's definitely what you should be doing. But not everybody is. And so, you know, the technology that we just sort of hand wavy call AI actually will allow certain tools to help you do that kind of stuff at a scale that you otherwise would have required, you know, human eyeballs looking at screens. Uh, and it still would actually take longer. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I think it kind of goes back to the impact that, you know, we're all, right now we're all being asked to do more with less. And so how do you do more with less? You have to leverage the available tools that are out there. You have to look at what the cutting edge technologies are. And I think that's where AI could help us get there and really show the impact of the work that we're able to do. And again, mm. maybe each researcher can cover you know, two squads instead of one squad and really mm. continue to show that business impact by having more research coverage. Yeah, research coverage is an interesting way to say that because again, you would have to hire somebody to have more coverage, traditionally speaking. But this this may be a way that allows us, I think, you know, either now or in the very near future to do that pretty confidently without having to just open up headcount necessarily. And I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but if this work is getting done and we're making better decisions, I mean, generally speaking, that sounds like something everybody wants to do. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, you know, something else that uh, people often talk about with uh, is AI coming from my job kind of thing is, you know, you mentioned the, this idea of like strategic insights and spending a lot of the time having uh, a different kind of impact at that level. Maybe could you talk a little bit more about what you mean when you refer to that? We see, you know, the research teams that we work with, there is more of the day-to-day -day decisions that need to be validated or invalidated. You know, it could be um, a quick usability test or on a mock-up. It could be making sure a new feature is meeting customer expectations. And I would say the more day-to-day -day research is what we're focused on at Sprig. Mm -hmm. uh, it's usually a little more higher frequency. It's, you know, codes being shipped on a daily or weekly basis. New designs are being you know, created on a daily or weekly basis and really setting up uh, researchers, product managers, designers to get a uh, quick feedback, you know, on the changes they're making, the designs they're working on. And the area that we're less focused on, we talk about that focus, you know, at the beginning of the call, and this is probably more where you guys come in, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps is more around those larger strategic projects. And perhaps it's launching an entirely new product line. A lot of companies right now are focused on tool consolidation. How can we sure. be many products under one uh, brand? Yeah. And we're seeing that, for example, in the sales tech space right now, mm -hmm. a lot of consolidation of different tools. And that's a huge investment, potentially millions, tens of millions of dollars in R&D and go to market and marketing mm -hmm. and branding. And so... Maybe it's expanding to a new market. Maybe a company wants to expand into Europe and open up, you know, an office in Europe. When we think about these larger, bigger business questions, you know, maybe iterating or updating an ICP. When I was at Weebly, we were focused originally on 
small business owners. And we started to really focus on e-commerce uh, small business owners and really narrow our focus there. And research drove a lot of that strategic shift mm -hmm. to where we should focus the business and what that solution is to really meet that ideal customer profile's needs. Mm -hmm. And so we think about these larger questions that a business might be facing. That's where we see the interest in the researchers really wanting to step in there. It's more exciting. It's larger, more complex questions, but also they can have more impact on the business. Yeah, And that's where other tools like Sprig can help them really hand off or help democratize. I know a little bit of a, yeah, you know, we're yep. that. Uh, <laughs> Just like is, mentioning NPS, that's another one. <laughs> Very strong reactions one way or the other. Very polarizing. But uh, for those that are interested in getting other people involved or somewhat involved uh, to an extent, you know, there are tools like Sprig that can help them do that. Yeah. So I'm super biased, uh, but I love where you went with this because um, really my interpretation of what you're saying is that user research, UX research can be used as a risk mitigation technique for these businesses. And the thing is, that's actually true today. AI has, it will only allow us to accelerate that as being a risk mitigation factor because of what you just described research can uncover the fact that maybe we shouldn't expand to Europe at all. <laughs> not, not the ways in which to do it, but, but the bigger strategic question of maybe we shouldn't do that at all. So, you know, everything what you just described to me very much sounds like managing risk for a business and you UX research, the people who do this work today can, and will be able to do that at scale. Now why that matters, tying this all back again to the impact most of the people I know, and I mean, being someone who works in the field for a long time as a UX researcher and, and strategy type person, I always wanted to work on that stuff. I wasn't as much interested in the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, is the prototype right? Is or Do we have a usability test for just like this update to a feature and stuff like that? I kind of wanted to work upstream more on these bigger strategic things. And this kind of technology enables us all to do more of that, which I have to believe is probably something appealing to everybody. Um, curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, I would I definitely second, you know, what you're you're making. I don't know if I have a lot to add because I think it was it was definitely spot on. Nice. Oh well good. We could just wrap it up. I guess uh, <laughs> I guess I nailed it. Um, no, but so the reason that uh, the reason I say that is to distill what you said. So uh, I'm I'm certainly not taking credit for it, but that's kind of my interpretation of it. And and again, I mean that goes back to the things that I think, and certainly I know from my experience in the field and, and folks that we talk to all the time, the impact that they want to have is that. And, uh, you know, I don't even know that I would call it democratization at that point. I would say being able to do other parts of the research that get in the way of you being strategic more efficiently. It is risk mitigation, putting some of that on autopilot as a means for you to spend the time and energy of what humans are really good at which is the more strategic work. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of times when we think about products and services and different jobs to be done, we often look at what's in it for the individual. What's the emotion? Mm -hmm. What's the feeling? What's the outcome for them? And one thing that we've noticed with researchers bringing Sprig into their organizations is that research, and this is what I saw at Weebly, you know, is that research was often a folder of decks yeah. or maybe it's a repository in Aurelius. Right. And maybe it's a hub of insights. And what we like to focus on of helping elevate research and say, instead of Google slide decks or PowerPoint presentations that maybe someone's presented and it gets lost, you know, I like to think that both Aurelius and Sprague were helping research teams have a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the researchers will, you know, come to us and say, Hey, you know, I want to have more visibility on the work that research is doing. You know, we have all this visibility into other data types. You know, maybe it's behavioral data or revenue data or a data science team 
is looking at you know behavioral metrics and you know causal insights are uh, and where I think we all want to go in the research field is that we're looking at behavioral data, we're looking at revenue data, but we're equally looking at sentiment research data mm-hmm. of what the end user thinks. And it's something that we've been really focused on is how we can elevate research data alongside all the other data types, yeah, like behavioral and revenue data. And how can we get the research data in front of leadership teams, executives, CEOs in the format that they're accustomed to. Yeah. Uh, and so that might be a looker dashboard, a tableau dashboard, and really help them understand that they can systematically understand the behavioral data, the, you know, what the users are doing, the revenue data, but just alongside it also look at the sentiment data mm-hmm. and together really get that complete picture. And by having that research data alongside the behavioral and revenue data, the leadership team, the executive team, the CEO can start to really see the impact and power of you know, quantitative research in um, a more analytical way mm-hmm. that can help them understand exactly what broadly their users might think in the moment. And so a lot of our customers have wired up their critical user journeys of you know onboarding and making trades and depositing and taking these longitudinal and product surveys, these scores, these themes from the AI, and then connecting it with their data warehouses, with their business intelligence dashboards, and building out these executive dashboards for leadership teams to really understand that this is something I can consume just like all the other data sets that, that I have. And imagine what the really is too, is that you're able to really centralize and make it more accessible and more visible, more people can consume and really understand. And it's not a deck that gets lost because right. I think that's what we want to avoid. And I think that's where we don't really get the impact of the work that research teams are doing. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's really funny that you, you bring up this focus on like a deck or a report because we have actually, this is an exact quote from a really customer once that said, uh, what Aurelius does for them is I'm going to, ch- hopefully I don't get this right. Uh, it releases insights from the prison of a slide deck. Exactly. And that was like so profound uh, to hear because our focus has always been, it sounds very similar to what you're trying to do with Sprig is we want to help researchers do the jobs that they do today faster and easier so that they have more time, focus and energy to have that impact up and spend the time helping executives and, you know, major uh, business leaders and and business decision makers use that to influence their decisions because they want to, those people at that level want to do that. Researchers want to have that impact. It's, it's, it's a win for everybody. Uh, And again, I think bringing it back to this topic of AI and UX research, I, I think that we ought to embrace that as the catalyst for this rather than thinking of it as taking something away from our job, but rather allowing us to focus on the things that have the greatest impact and that are the biggest win for everybody involved. Absolutely. And again, going back to impact, I think that's ultimately how we want all of our roles, you know, whether it's research, design, product management, engineering, what's the impact we can have, you know, on the business, on the product, you know, on our customers, on the world. And so that's how we measure success how we see a lot of the best in class research teams measure success is what is our impact to the product experience and can we inform the decisions that are being made and by maybe not democratizing research, but democratizing the data so that anyone can consume the data and have it really accessible and available is something that I think is, shouldn't be polarizing Right. Because we do want everybody across right. the org to be able to view and consume and really deeply understand the data. Whether you want someone running research is, you know, maybe we'll save that yeah. for another day. Totally. But I think getting that data in front of as many people as possible is really around that accessibility and impact of the data. Right. I, you know, I, I share that sentiment. I think that that's something everybody can probably agree on, that we want everyone to benefit from the value of research. Um. I love it. You know, on that note, I'm I'm realizing we're coming up to the end of our time together. 
And I, I could ask you a dozen more questions about this and the topic of AI and UX research, but I got to be respectful of your time. Um, so how we typically wrap things up on the show is I say, you know, if I got hit on the head, temporary amnesia, and somebody came to you and said, Ryan, I heard you did a podcast. What was that all about? How would you answer that? How would you summarize what we talked about? You know, I think the role of where I think any role is going, but research included, is doing more with less, you know, thinking about our roles evolving and thinking about our roles evolving where we're shifting from a creator to an editor and really embracing that editorial role that AI can really allow us to, you know, really step into. And I think being okay with that and being excited about that, embracing that and seeing that as an opportunity to have the biggest possible impact on the customers that we serve and have the deepest understanding and empathy for those customers that we serve. Got it. There's your summary. Put it on the postcard. Um, so this was awesome. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me about this. It's a topic that I am quite sure the conversation will continue on. Um, is there anything else you want to share with folks that we didn't get a chance to talk about today? We're always looking for teams to work with. And so I work with many of the fastest growing teams and companies and work with com- you know, research teams like Notion, you know, Square, uh, PayPal, Figma, and would love to get to know more research teams out there. And so we have a special offer for Aurelius listeners, so sprig.com slash Aurelius. And so sign up. We'd love to share more about how other research teams are measuring their user experience, doing longitudinal metrics and product surveys, session replay to deeply understand exactly how their users uh, feel in those moments, have that deep empathy for specific user moments and journeys and look forward to uh, meeting you there. Yeah, right on. Uh, and for folks listening to this, obviously you can go to that right to that URL. We're going to have links to that in the show notes of where we post this on our blog as well. Folks want to reach out to you, ask you questions, continue the conversation. How might they get in touch with you to do that? Twitter and LinkedIn. So slash Ryan Glasgow, uh, just right. the city and both Twitter and LinkedIn DMS are open. We'd love to hear from you. Right on. We're going to have links to that too, where you can find Ryan, uh, ask him questions fight with him about democratization if you want to. <laughs> no, I'm not inviting that for you. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you, we're going to have links to all that stuff. Ryan, really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. And uh, we uh, we look forward to continue this conversation elsewhere as well. Zach, this has been great. Thanks for having me. Awesome. All right, everybody. We will see you next time.